thanks so much, everybody. I, I really appreciate you being here. It's a really important topic. Um, I, I'm going to give my a two minute spiel about my background, how I came to this, and then I asked our panelists to also talk uh, about their important work over the years in preserving and conserving uh, Long Island's wetlands. Uh, and then we'll get into some, some Q&A. I want to keep this very casual and just sort of a uh, you know, discussion back and forth. So, you know, I graduated from law school after having gotten a master's in biological science. And I said, now what? Started um, simple consulting with the idea that I'd be working with environmental not-for-profits and doing some grant writing and, you know, working with individuals and organizations that, I wanna, uh, that really care about the environment. I wanted to kind of uh, make a living doing good for the environment. Um, Todd Shaw quickly realized that if you put me on the board, he can get all my services for free. Um, so, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm here now and I've been, uh, you know, rendering free services for the organization. I couldn't be more grateful for the opportunity. We, you know, this this upstart little organization has has really come into its own, working with some of the um, the, the main players here on Long Island, and, and I'm grateful to be the director of uh, habitat restoration here. Along the way, I started Spadefoot Design and Construction. Uh, the whole mission great of, uh, yes, great species. It's uh, named after a toad, of course, because who doesn't name a uh, landscaping company after a toad, um, right? You know, the whole idea behind Spadefoot is um, it just ecological restoration. What does that mean? Uh, addition by subtraction, right? Invasive species removal, stormwater management solutions using biological science as the sort of the basis of it. Uh, and, and really just, uh, as opposed to decorating with native plants, uh, we do you know, restoration of ecosystems. We look for communities of plants that work together you know, to restore um, the structure and function of people's yards of public spaces and so on. And uh, it, it's amazing to be able to kind of talk about this work uh, with, with the folks here and, and still and bring some of the expertise that I've garnered uh, with Save the Great South Bay into my, into my practice. So, the, you know, that's my one minute introduction. Maybe I'd let over that one minute, but I, I would love for, you know, the estimable, pa estimable, 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 gosh, yeah. estimable. That's a, that's a tough one. That's harder than an attribute. Yeah. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> so, um, you know, the esteem, my esteemed colleagues, if you could just spend a couple minutes talking about all of your work here and, uh, you know, saving and preserving Long Island's wetlands. Okay, sure. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Again, John Turner with the SeaTuck Environmental Association. Uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with SeaTuck, uh, it's been around for several decades. Got its start um, over <clears throat> by the SeaTuck National Wildlife Refuge, uh, really helping to pioneer efforts to protect colonial water birds, that is, you know, terns and, and, and plovers, <laughs> oyster catchers, things like that, most notably along the South Shore. And since that time, the organization has uh, spread its wings and is involved in a wide variety of topics. A lot of wildlife species <clears throat> that we work on in wildlife you know, policies. Um, we have kind of a three-prong approach really involved with education, education uh, from <clears throat> small children up, up to adults. Uh, we do a fair amount of, of science, and then uh, some of us are involved in, in advocacy work. And, I want to point out, Mike, if you could just raise your hand, Mike Petiti in the back. Mike is another staff person with, with SeaTalk. And so if you have any questions about river otters, um, spotted turtles, and pretty much anything dealing with natural history on Long Island, you may want to talk with, with Mike as well. Um, but uh, our interest in, in wetlands has, has gone back a, a long way. And I, I, I guess I'll hold off on I'll talk about some of the substance I wanted to present to you today. But, but to, to say that we, we are excited by where things stand with regard to wetland protection, we're in a process about probably two thirds of the way through of uh, an extensive, comprehensive, island-wide vertical pool inventory work, which you may have heard about or not, I hope to inform you today. Um, but I do want to talk more about vertical pools because they're fascinating areas. Uh, I was hoping to present some, some information. I, I did bring the computer, but if afterwards, if you want to see um, any of the 310 vertical pools that we've identified so far, we have ground truthing them, trying to identify what species are within them, most notably, you know, rare, rare amphibians and some other things. Um, and, and the hope is that we can advance conservation of vertical pools um, on, the, on the island. Um, that's really the main goal of, of that vertical pool initiative, very significant initiative. Um, and when I, some of the things I like to talk about, but let me pass that microphone over to others. That, Okay. 
Do you hear me now? Yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Nicole Marr. I am the senior, senior coastal scientist with the Nature Conservancy here in New York, and I've been the wetlands person for the Nature Conservancy here for the last 16 years. One of the first projects I started um, was in salt marshes on, on Long Island. I started a network of monitoring stations from New York City all the way to the eastern end of Long Island because before that, we didn't know whether our salt marshes were keeping pace with sea level rise. So we've been collecting data on whether or not these marshes are keeping uh, pace with sea level rise. We've got a network of over two dozen stations being monitored by partners and the Nature Conservancy. And also importantly, we're um, researching why some of our marshes are are not keeping pace with sea level rise. We're researching the reasons for those elevation shortfalls so that we can address those threats and uh, keep our wetlands healthy for the long term. And one of those um, research projects Robin referenced is a real world experiment because we have the opportunity now that we have um, upgraded the nitrogen removal at the Bay Park sewage treatment plant and are eventually going to connect it to an offshore outfall, we have the opportunity to measure how our salt marshes respond when we turn off that long-term nutrient pollution and give them the clean water they need. So I'm measuring the stickiness of the marsh pee and uh, taking cores to look at the below ground roots and rhizomes, but actually by running those cores through a hospital CAT scanner. Um, and so I, I really enjoy getting into the nitty gritty of how these systems are functioning. And one way to do that is really because restoration science is not fixed, we don't know everything that we need to know, is by collaborating with partners. And so I had a wonderful opportunity to work um, as part of Suffolk County's uh, post Sandy restoration grant from NIFWIP. Not only was that grant to do on the ground restoration of salt marshes, but very importantly, hosted a two year learning exchange with restoration practitioners from Maine to Virginia so that we could learn from each other, provide some real time peer review of projects, improve those projects in real time. And that's been really, really super. Um, also across Long Island, I've worked on the road stream crossing assessments so that we can make sure that um, water can move smoothly underneath our, our roads, both for public safety, but also for ecological benefit. Um, and my main restoration project right now is out in East Hampton, New York, uh, using citizen science data to inform minimally invasive uh, restoration. And finally, I would say when I think about restoration, I think about not restoring to some point in the past, but restoring those natural processes that wetlands need to be dynamic and function today and into the future. And I think of it in sort of a simple five ingredient recipe and not a recipe you'll find on epicurious.com but they need clean water they need mobile sediment supply they need that full tidal exchange these are tidal systems they are what they are and they do what they do because the tide comes in and the tide goes out and very importantly they need room to move because they're not going to be able to keep pace with sea level rise exactly where they are today so they really need that ability to migrate landward and they need the appreciation of all people like you um, and communities so that we make decisions now to support what they need to persist into the future. So thank you all for your interest in being here today. Okay, I'll, if you insist. <laughs> that's right, not spreading the drink. Okay, yeah. Um, so first, um, as you can see, an enormous privilege uh, to have worked with somebody of Nicole's expertise um, you know, all I do is, you know, kind of connect a couple of dots and draw on the, you know, experience and brilliance of others. Um, and I don't even take credit for it at the end of the day. I, I reserve that for my boss and other people who are elected, people who work for elected, you know how that works. Um, and I just wanted to tell uh, John Turner, who is over at CTOP, that uh, one of the submissions that we are currently um, uh, putting into the HMB, HMPG, which is Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, I have the little reversal at the end, uh, is uh, for wetland restoration um, at the Scully Estate. Right. Um, so uh, that's his backyard. Uh, we have a number of others, and it's all, all delineated uh, in this uh, little, uh, I think, 10-pager that, that you have in your packets. Um, and it'll give you an update rather than me going through every one of them, because there are quite a few, of what the county is, in fact, doing uh, to address wetland, uh, particularly tidal wetland restoration. I know that um, my uh, esteemed uh, colleague, or my estimable colleague, uh, Frank Pichigini, uh, will be also talking a little bit later about the work you guys have done uh, in terms of getting uh, a really a, a firmer and um, more 
uh, dynamic piece of legislation relative to uh, fresh water wet wetlands. Uh, but my, my bona fides are fairly straightforward. Uh, I um, have uh, resided part-time or full-time on the Great South Bay since 1957. Um, I live in West Gilgo Beach. Uh, I worked at the Oak Beach Inn as a bartender. I see <laughs> an Oak Beach resident over there, yeah. Carl Vogel. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's my that's my local bona fides. My, um, I guess, uh, environmental bona fides begins back uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, where I was, uh, as a sophomore, uh, the media liaison for the first Earth Week uh, in 1970. Um, and uh, as such, um, I was working with, uh, and I'm sure at least Frank will know who this is, a man named Ian McCard, uh, who wrote a phenomenal book called uh, Design with, with Nature. He's the original landscape architect who did the overlays on which we are now basing uh, our GPS. Uh, and importantly, <coughs> relative to this topic, um, really sounded the alarms after uh, the nor'easters in 1960 on the Jersey Shore. And really, uh, I delineated for people who like living in proximity to coastal regions, how sensibly they should be, you know, really placing the residences. We already see what's happening on the Outer Banks in North Carolina. Um, so, for example, at West Gilgo Beach, even though you have a dynamic beach situation and we are the beneficiaries of beach replenishment, um, and I might add, uh, we also have a five lane ocean parkway, which we call our insurance policy because we are absolutely confident that the few houses that are on that barrier beach would not be receiving those services if not for that uh, highway that uh, is going from one end to the other of the Jones Barrier Beach. Um, so I also want to point out a couple of other people in the audience. There's Bob Grover, who's a, a, a geomorphologist, um, has done a phenomenal amount of work. Uh, he's a little younger than me, so I've been around a little longer. Uh, but he's done much more work than I have. Uh, we have Dave Berg, who is a, 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 an absolute expert on bioextraction, um, and it worked for Cameron Engineer, uh, Engineering for decades. Uh, so these are the kinds of people you want to tap into so that you know you can move the dial just as we were able to do by working in the coal mine. Uh, and uh, is it Mara Mayer? That's not a swimmer. Yeah, I think it's Mara. It's Mara. Yeah, I, went, I, I, had a, I had a friend who was the coach of the Columbia basketball team, Buddy Mara, and was the same spelling. Um, so um, that's pretty much the long and short of where I'm coming from. I'm going to delve into more of the um, applications coming out of the county. Uh, and it's not just in terms of restoration. Um, you know, we're also looking to the causes of the decimation. We know that, for example, uh, approximately in most places, uh, the wetlands have decreased from uh, from uh, 74 to 2008 by around 30 percent on average. Uh, we know that since uh, the 1930s, we've lost 90 percent of our eelgrass. So these are all areas in which we are uh, looking to return to yesterday. And I'm not going to say make Long Island great again, but uh, I just did. <laughs> 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 <That's great again. laughs> okay, excellent. Uh, th thanks so much for introducing yourselves. And again, it's an honor to be here with all of you. Um, I, I guess I, I wanted to uh, start a little bit at the beginning here, uh, a, a bit of a primer for the audience, if you will. You know, I remember growing up in North Massapequa, looking at my field guide and saying, oh, these species are supposed to be here. Where are they? And why are they not here? Um, and, and, you know, I'd scratch my head. And then I realized that, you know, we impounded uh, most of our, our riparian areas. You know, we, we've, we've developed on, on these vernal pools um, and our coastal areas are under development pressure and, and pressure from nitrogen input and whatnot. So. Uh, Maybe we could do for the audience, you know, where are Long Island's wetland, wetlands? What types of wetlands are there? And, and what are some of the stressors, you know, facing these wetlands? So, you know, I know we have a, we have a variety of um, expertise here, which is great. So, so, so maybe, John, you could talk, take us through some of the freshwater stuff, and then, and then the two of you could kind of take us more through coastal work, um, you know, if you will. Just kind of share with us. Okay, thank you. That's a tall task. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we, we have... Uh, if you go into the New York Natural Heritage Program, probably the best single source and look up ecological communities of New York State, it'll put you to sleep. No, it won't. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually several hundred pages where uh, you know, scientists up in Albany have, have documented basically the biodiversity um, exists in the state at, at various scales and levels. They do it by species and they do it by natural communities. So if you go into that uh, document, again, it's actually outstanding. Um, you can see uh, the uh, delineation of uh, uh, freshwater wetland communities that exist throughout the state and, and on Long Island. And they are they really are uh, very varied. 
um, involving uh, riverine um, and, and streamside wetland communities. Uh, there's a few freshwater marshes. One of the, uh, I, I think, uh, wetland types that's been lost to a large extent are freshwater marshes. I can only think of a, a few cases. Probably the best example is that, uh, to the county's credit, uh, the, the, the cattail marsh uh, out at Big Reed Pond in Montauk County Park. That's an outstanding uh, freshwater marsh system. But there's a few others. Um, there's a number of, of course, uh, uh, hardwood uh, wetland forests, you know, swamps of different types, dominated by most typically fairly common trees like red maple and black tupelo and sweet gum. And then one, one plant I want to make a pitch for, and I actually brought a couple of remaining, if you're interested, uh, Botanical Society uh, newsletters. Um, there's a wonderful plant, uh, Robin's smiling ear to ear because it's ear to her, um, Atlantic White Cedar. And we have, uh, <clears throat> Eric Clement and I spent, I spent actually almost two decades trying to document every known historic and, and, and extent um, occurrence of Atlantic White Cedar uh, on Long Island. And that, that monograph is the result, or that newsletter is the result of our work. So feel free to take it, copies of, of that. Atlantic White Cedar swamps are fascinating. Uh, if you want to have an experience that's borderline otherworldly, I encourage you to put on, uh, you know, hip waders uh, or at least boots and go out to uh, the white cedar swamps that exist uh, in the county park system or uh, some of that uh, at, like at North Sea. Uh, these are uh, swamps that the, the amount of biomass above ground is remarkable. You're walking between trees that are, you know, five times the width of these pillars right here. Uh, really, fairly old, and there, these uh, white cedars are growing on a uh, organic, um, uh, you know, uh, peat mat that can go down dozens of feet from the lens when Long Island was, you know, glaciated. Mm -hmm. They were just remarkable communities, and so if you want to fall in love with Atlantic white cedar, you certainly there's opportunity to do that. So that's a, a fairly rare, um, uh, you know, wetland uh, community type that we have. And then last thing, I want to just uh, again to take too much time, but but to talk about uh, uh, vernal poles uh, that exist. In your packet is one um, handout um, that, if I can find it, that it's just a one-page sheet that shows uh, the, uh, it's, it's this one that's front and back. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm still fighting um, congestion. Um, and you'll see that uh, this screenshot, actually with all those icons, documents that th about 310 vernal poles that we have um, found on the island with the help of a lot of volunteers. And for those of you that aren't familiar with vernal poles, they are typically small uh, wetlands that are temporary in nature. They get the name vernal poles. Sorry, distracted. Um, <laughs> what was that? Yeah. Foster. 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 Verticals uh, hold water most typically highest water levels in the spring, so hence the name vernal. And then as uh, trees leaf out, an evaporation and evapotranspiration really kick in as the warm weather comes on, these vernal pools will often dry out. And so you could go to a vernal pool again in, in late summer and not see any any expression of water whatsoever. And then that's resulted in, in many of them being destroyed because they're small in size, they're easy. And you just don't there's no no real water there but they're fascinating places in the spring they are uh, an important habitat for a wide variety of uh of rare animals uh some we call vernal pool obligate species most notably two species wood frogs and spotted salamanders but there's others in the pine barrens there's tiger salamanders there's marble salamanders there's blue spotted salamanders um, and there's some other frog and toad species like spadefoots <laughs> that, that utilize these verticals. They depend upon these verticals to a large extent because again, they do dry out. They don't, if they, somebody did introduce fish, the fish will die because fish and, and, and amphibians, particularly amphibian larvae and uh, apes don't get along real well. So uh, they're really uh, communities that are critical for uh, if we want to have healthy amphibian populations on the island. So we've been trying to document uh, all the verticals <clears throat> hoping that we can encourage uh, government, particularly at the local level, to buy properties that have vertical poles on them. And here's what the good news is that, based on the work we've done, 
about three quarters of the vernal pools we have discovered are already on land that's publicly protected. So that's that's wonderful news. And again, I'll, I'll shout out to the county. If you don't know about the county park system and the quality, the ecological quality of that system, I'd encourage you to make uh, a connection with it uh, because a lot of the really fascinating vernal pools that we've discovered around county county park property. But so we want to we do want to see those that are on private property acquired if the landowner is willing. <coughs> And the last thing I'll say about that is that we're in the process actually of a written a draft, in fact, that we for it to be kind of reviewed by Enrico and others, but a, a landowner's guide to vernal pool management. And that is, it's going to be like a 16 fold tri, tri fold, I guess. That will, uh, if you're a property <coughs> that's got a vernal pool, you're concerned about that vernal pool. These are the things that you can do to help maintain the integrity and quality of that vernal pool so that is species that are found within it. So our hope is to get a real conservation uh, element to it, to see those vernal pools that are on privately owned land protected by being, being acquired. And for those that will remain on privately owned land, that the uh, the property owner will uh, be interested in doing the right thing to maintain them um, in uh, in the future. So that's a real brief uh, fresh water flip. A lot more, a lot, I barely scratched the surface. Well, thanks, John. I have a lot to learn about freshwater wetlands, and so I would love to learn more about vernal pools and our um, re our remaining freshwater wetlands on Long Island. My um, experience is mostly with our tidal salt water wetlands, which we are fortunate to have a lot, not as much as we had historically here on the south shore of Long Island, but Long Island has great wetlands along its south shore out on the east end in the Peconic Estuary, and some nice um, wetlands on the North Shore as well, but because of the geology, those are in sort of pockets and harbors and, and not as extensive as they are here on the South Shore of Long Island. Um, like John, I also get excited about the animals that benefit from our salt marshes, and salt marshes do so much for us people and adjacent habitats. Um, um, but but you know, they fuel our coastal food web, they store carbon, they cycle nutrients, they provide risk reduction from storms by attenuating wave energy, trap pollutants, um, and they provide really important habitat for, for wildlife as well. And we've got some birds that live their entire lives in salt marshes. And um, one in particular that we are lucky to have here is the salt marsh sparrow that is endemic to the eastern U.S. It lives its entire life in salt marshes. It breeds in salt marshes up here in the Northeast. It overwinters in the salt marshes down in the Carolinas and Virginia. And so it's adopted these really cool life strategies to build a nest and raise a clutch of eggs between the highest moon tides. And so really fascinating creature. And it's one of the reasons, and it, our um, population projections for that bird our salt marsh migration projections and sea level rise projections so that if we don't get our restoration done right and done now, this bird will be extinct by the 2050s. So we have an opportunity, you know, by paying attention to our wetlands now to protect them for all they do for us people and for, for nature, um, we have an opportunity to, to get that right uh, done now. Because so with all these things that salt marshes do for us, they, they are essentially keeping our coastal environments healthy. And then all of our cultural and economic activities that depend on a healthy coastal ecosystem are dependent on functioning um, salt marshes. So. so I've got a question for my far more expert uh, uh, cohort up here, and that is um, about avian life. And uh, I, I know that there are clearly a number of uh, people around here who are comparable age as I am, uh, who go back to the DDT days of 1960 uh, and don't remember much avian life at all. Uh, and so I have heard uh, about the diminution of uh, you know uh, na nationwide uh, bird population uh, going down by three billion. I think that's uh, the number that I heard. Uh, but anecdotally, because I don't do uh, the uh, actual inventory, uh, the proliferation of uh, seabirds and uh, other avian life uh, in my neck of the woods has been astonishing. Well, the ospreys are just flourishing. Um, we get, uh, you know, the egrets, we get the ibises, uh, we get, um, you know, the 
occasional uh, bald eagle. We get the snowy white owl, uh, and among others. Uh, herons. I, you know, that's and, and, and uh, we have the um, the gannets uh, actually, um, and I have picked up a couple that fortunately have succumbed on the beach. But kindly reflect on this. You know, I, I would suggest. Um, and, and it's good news. I, to me, it's good news that all this, you know, that we have this flourishing life. In, in the face of, as Nicole has mentioned, di uh, diminishing um, wetlands, um, but yet with um, clear evidence that a lot of the bird species are thriving, um, how does that play out, um, both in terms of how, it's, how we've gotten here and how it conceivably will uh, go uh, as we move as we go forward? Well, John, do you want to so tackle? So I, I can speak. Both of us. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, in, in terms of, I, I think it, I don't know the numbers, but the anecdotal to so the observations that we've got, sort of greater um, bird, bird, seabird activity off our shores and um, bird activity in our marshes is, is wonderful. I don't, I don't have the data to speak to that, but I know that in terms of the salt marsh sparrows, because they cue in on the species of grasses growing in the marsh to know how frequently that area will be flooded and where to build their nests that um it's protecting that that high marsh habitat is important for them protecting so low marsh habitat may be important for for other birds right so do you yeah. want to take it from there john yeah was it oh i turned it on okay, okay thank you uh, Kind of the, the sweep of, of coastal habitats um, I'm thinking about is, is, you know, birds in those habitats are doing pretty well, I think. I mean, they certainly are facing specific, you know, certain species are facing specific threats. Uh, but uh, the news, you're right, Dorian, has generally been, uh, been an uptick in, in, in good news. Uh, ospreys have rebounded remarkably since the nadir of the DDT days. I would argue that, by the way, just a slightly controversial point, I do a lot of research on natural history on Long Island through the years and come across documentation that I, I, I would make the case that Long Island may have had, I, I underline the word may, um, the most densest concentration of ospreys anywhere in the world back mm -hmm. centuries ago. Um, the, the habitats that are here, again, productive, <clears throat> extensive, shallow coastal water that or you know, at, the, at one time where there was very little disturbance where ospreys could even nest on the ground, which they're starting to do again on the island. In certain places, they do it on Gardner's Island, other places that are undisturbed. Um, I think Long Island was was one of the absolute strongholds globally for ospreys, and now they're, they're coming back. And it, to the point where DEC, if you remember Mike, if you know Mike Scheibel and others, they used to, document the, excuse me, each year, they, they inventory the, the numbers of osprey nests and uh, count them. And that, that's old hack, they don't do that anymore. There's just so many hundreds of osprey nests and they're, they're growing each year. You hear about people putting up new platforms because trying to accommodate the, the young that are doing well. So if you ever want to see an example of where policy works, important environmental policy that could benefit wildlife, just a ban on DDT, which by the way, started on Long Island and is a wonderful, book uh, by Charlie Worcester called The DDT Wars. The book came out about what, two, three years ago, I think. It's a wonderful documentation of the of the nationwide battle, the decade-long battle, to try to get DDT banned. And Charlie and his colleagues were Stony Brook University professors. They wanted, of course, to form EDF. So that whole hotbed of activity was uh, something that took place on Long Island. So because anyway, in terms of other species of, of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, wildlife, the terns are doing pretty well. I think there's some concern about long-term um, population decline and the foraging fish that they depend upon. We'll have to see about that. But with the return of Menhaden, again, and the fish that you're, you're familiar with, that has, again, fueled uh, uh, you know, cormorants and, and, and ospreys and, and uh, again, bald eagles and, and, and some others. So I think I'd say, again, the, the news for most coastal species is pretty good. Um, I, I chatted recently with the, the head of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the piping clover efforts. You know, as you know, piping clover numbers continue to uptick, continue to uh, you know have an upward trend as we just provide enough good old TLC to them. There's enough people going out, actively documenting where they're <laughs> nesting um, and trying to protect their uh, their nest sites with the symbolic string fencing and, and some other strategies. So. You know, plovers are, are looking good. And in fact, about, I think, almost a third 
of the piping plovers on the East Coast are found on Long Island. So Long Island is a critical um, you know, part uh, of, of their range and part of the you know, overall welfare of the species. Just a few things. I'll try to take that too, but and, and there are some really great stories here, no doubt due uh, in part to the tireless efforts of my colleagues and so on. Um, not to make it uh, at all doom and gloom, I, you do have to look upland a little bit. So, so my expertise is a terrestrial ecologist, right? Yeah, and, and yeah, not, not as good, especially in places like Nassau County where it's so densely developed. And you know, growing up again in North Massapequa, very happily on a humble, uh, you know, less than a quarter acre lot, uh, there were still a lot of trees over there, lots of oaks. Um, and, and if any of read, you know, I, I'm inspired by the work of Douglas Talame. Uh, nature's best hope and you know a big author and what, and what his major lesson is that uh, these, these oaks and these native tree species are, are really home to uh, caterpillars a lot of pollinator species and this is really important for birds right because these these pollinator these species are uh, you know really fat sacks of fat and protein that that really feed the birds these chicks uh, you know and unfortunately where I grew up what used to be a, a tree line canopy is now you know uh, most of those trees come down. Uh, the fear mongering tree guy, uh, tree guys out there are all out there saying that you know your your house and well, all of your children and your puppy too will die if you keep this tree here. Hire me to take this tree down. Uh, and and so what we're left with is this sort of moonscape of uh, you know just lawns with a with a token red maple that doesn't support biodiversity. Uh, and so looking upland, uh, the the picture is not nearly as good. The, the good news is, is from my standpoint, uh, and, and is that nature is resilient and, and good land use practices can really lead to remarkable results as evidenced by the success that we, we've had with our coastal birds. Uh, so plant native plants, for goodness, uh, you, you know, just a small patch, if everybody had just a small patch, and we have a little uh, solutions part of this, uh, we're going a little bit off topic here. So I, I just wanted to kind of point out while uh, all the efforts are, you know, I'm buoyed by the efforts of, of, of my colleagues and the success on coastal species. We, we have a lot of work to do upland. Um, and just to, just to go back to the background part, um, I, I think this is this one point uh, is sort of lost on a lot of folks here on Long Island is the, the ponds that are all across uh, the South Shore of Long Island. And I wanted to use air quotes when I said ponds because most of them are impoundments. They're, they're just pu big, giant puddles. Uh, so I was wondering if, uh, if, if John or somebody or, would just kind of tell everybody, uh, you know, why they're not ponds, why they're impoundments, and why does that matter from an ecological standpoint? Does anybody want to take that? Yeah. I'll yeah. Okay, yeah. Anyone want to talk first? I've been going. Oh. You know. Okay. So um, yeah, the connection between upland and our coastal waters is really important. We have these um, diadromous fish that uh, spend part of their life in salt water and part in fresh water. And so in order to do that, they need to be able to move mm -hmm. from salt water to fresh water and back to salt. So SeaTac um, <laughs> has done a wonderful job with their diadromous uh, fish survey. Um, and the Nature Conservancy um, complemented that with an assessment of uh, road stream crossings. So some of these are actual impoundments with dams, others are unintended dams because the culverts that were put under the roads were too small to allow adequate water to come in and to go out. And so this affects so it affects the biology because it affects the species that can move one way or another and get to their breeding and, and foraging grounds. It also affects the chemistry of these impoundments where um, you know, freshwater impoundments are emitting methane, a greenhouse causing gas, where in, in contrast, if these areas were tidal salt marshes before they were impounded and converted to freshwater impoundments, tidal, um, tidal marsh that is growing and trapping sediment is actually a carbon sink uh, to help mitigate the effects of climate change. Um, and so the Nature Conservancy had started the road stream crossing assessment with both freshwater crossings and I led the tidal crossings assessment. And we're so fortunate to have CTUC pick it up to take it from where it is to expand the geography to include Nassau County. Um, and so that's that's really super big. It, and, and I guess one last point is that these undersized road stream crossings, they're not only an ecological issue or a climate resilience issue, they're a public safety issue because if the volume of water that wants to get through that undersized culvert 
is too large. It's going, it has erosive forces and it will erode on either sides of that culvert, undermining the road, undermining um, that coastal evacuation route, et cetera. Of course, flooding is right. And cause flooding, yeah. Adjacent to it, but. Yeah, I wanna maybe just amplify for two minutes about, uh, again, an adjurist <laughs> fish. Uh, one of the, I think, neatest uh, components of uh, natural history on Long Island are these these fish that, uh, you know, quietly and miraculously come back to Long Island's waters each year. I mean, everybody knows about, not everybody, you know, about bird migration. We welcomed the return of Baltimore Orioles, which came back in the last week to 10 days, and a lot of all the migratory songbirds. But, but uh, <clears throat> fish are, many fish species are highly migratory too, and they, they return to, uh, again, Long Island and and often unbeknownst to us, they uh, will try to move up into the streams. And again, things like alewives, alewife runs, you know, the river herring are just remarkable uh, uh, components of our natural history heritage. And at SeaTuck, we, we've got a, a pretty significant effort where we're trying, using volunteers to try to document these runs of river herring. If you've never seen a river herring run, um, I'd encourage you to go out and do it. It's too, little, too late for this year, but you'll have the experience next year. Um, I will note that, that there's been a concerted effort on Long Island to try to connect uh, a lot of the stream segments that are, are the, the kind of the ecological threat has been disconnected to reconnect them through the establishment of uh, typically fish ladders of various technologies. <clears throat> or sometimes they, they have these you know rock ramps like at Grand Civil Park at Riverhead, you've got the rock ramp there that allow for the alewives and eels to move back. Um, into the freshwater streams. So the alewives come back uh, in the uh, in the spring. The adults go up into the, where they can, up into the freshwater systems. They spawn. The adults quickly head out. And then uh, two months later or so, the, the young will then, then follow. Well, American eels do just the opposite, of course. They come into the freshwater to develop, spend several decades here, and they spawn. Unlike alewives that spawn in freshwater, as you know, the eels spawn or made out in the... Uh, in the ocean, in the Sargasso Sea, so fascinating work that's been done in that regard. But they're they're part of Long Island's heritage, and you can experience that. We've not done a great job with alewife uh, runs protecting them nearly as good as they've done throughout New England, particularly Massachusetts. It's something that was really treasured and cherished by people um, for for many many centuries, and uh, we've, we've caught up a little bit here um, now. And uh, there's any number of fish ladders that have been put in. Most notable one. Right now, we just completed, again, with the support of the county, is the, the uh, fish ladder at the, the Woodhole Dam, which is just, if you go out to the Riverhead County Center where the legislature meets, just south of that, the, the Little River, which is one of the four tributaries to the Peconic, that whole system now has been opened up for our lives. They just completed the, the work. As I, I have pictures on my phone if you want to see from yesterday. I swung by to see it. Um, it's really pretty remarkable fish ladder. And that, that hopefully will allow, again, for our lives and eels to gain access all the way up through the Little River, up into Cranberry Bog County Nature Preserve, and then continue upstream all the way to Wildwood Lake, which is a you know, pretty deep water body in, in Southampton that these, uh, again, alewives and eels will be able to both spawn and develop with it. Can you talk a little bit about Westbrook too? What's happening? Oh yeah, there? Oh, yeah good, yeah, sure, yeah. So not too far from here, uh, what, are, what, are the, let me think, what are the strategies that we have? In fact, that the, the ideal strategy, uh, the most effective strategy, um, for uh, allowing, uh, again, these, these fish to gain access is, are not fish ladders, it's removal of the dam. And, and that's something that's happening all around the country. Remar it's remarkable, but I think there's in the ballpark of something like 85,000 dams in the United States. Wow, different sizes. Yeah, the, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, some of the Hoover and Great Cooley, down to very, very small dams that are maybe not traverse this table. I'm just going to interject very right. quickly on that subject because I've had an exchange with Enrico, um, that's uh, his co uh, co colleague at uh, CTEP. Um, and, you know, one of, I'm always looking at the, you know, the balance sheet side of things. So if we're going to be spending like a couple million dollars on a fish ladder, my question is, if it's going on a dam, maybe really we should just wait to remove that dam. Of course, that presents problems itself because there are people who are living, you know, uh, in these impoundments. Uh, that have been created by dams who like to be next to water. So if you're suddenly proposing to radically modify that, you're going to have some issues to deal with. Uh, so that's always the practical side of these more yeah. like um, you know uh, aspirational um, type type of propositions. Um, but uh, and I also just want to also as long as I'm yapping, 
I, I, I'm going to just also speak to uh, uh, Frank's concern in terms of human engro encroachment, which is, you know, let's face it, we are living in the Anthropocene. It's called the Anthropocene for a reason, because, you know, back when I was in college, there were 3.2 billion people, uh, you know, worldwide, and now they're like 8.4 billion. And in this country, there were like 220 million, and now up to 330 million. You know, more people, more resources, more crowding. Uh, the big news, I think, for Suffolk and why this again is encouraging. We have a very robust um, open uh, space acquisition program. Over 100,000 um, uh, acres have been acquired. And, and uh, to put that as a point of comparison, the historical uh, acreage of, of marshes, both fresh and tidal, is something like 51,000. So double that. We have uh, agricultural uh, preservation so that farms in turn don't become you know, sprawling developments. Um, and uh, the other interesting piece of news, because my colleague Sarah Lansdale pulled this one off, is the bay bottom uh, of the Peconic Bay, with, uh, in, in terms of the aquaculture release program out there, is now an ag district. Um, so it has all the benefits that come along uh, with an ag, ag, dis, ag district. And every time I jump in, it's only going to be because I'm going to be introducing the, the governmental you know, mechanisms that can conceivably realize a lot of these aspirations. So go back to what you're saying. Okay, yeah, sure. Thank you, Jordan. So uh, to finish with Frank's point about, wanted to talk about West, uh, Westbrook. If you're, if you're familiar with Westbrook, um, a little uh, you know, further um, east from here, it's a, uh, you know, trip, a trip to the uh, Connecticut River, and um, it runs up through Bayard Cutting. You pull aside on Montauk Highway, just a little bit west of the merge where Montauk Highway and Summers Highway come together. Start it. Go back, binoculars in the car. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, the dam there that allowed for the impoundment to, to exist for many, many years, which is a popular fishing spot, blew out. A, well, something happened, but, but it blew out a couple of years ago. We have been strongly advocating to not rebuild that dam, to have a place where again, Hellwives could come in and, and go and continue. In fact, uh, Enrico is speaking at 11 o'clock, I think, via Zoom about our efforts to, to try to achieve that, as well as to try, we're trying to control the, the, the Phragmites that uh, exists there. And uh, uh, I've had a number of, in fact, some of you have been participating in Phragmites polls uh, at that site. So we're hopeful that the State Parks Commission will, uh, We'll, we'll make the ultimate determination not to rebuild the dam, but to allow the, the natural free flowing conditions to, uh, to be maintained. And that's, you know, Dorian raises a very good point. It, it's a, a big issue for people that are concerned about, again, diagenous fish, um, <clears throat> because of the, these dams that were constructed all around Long Island for very good reasons, you know, for, for woolen mills and for, uh, um, you know, grist mills and a whole host of other, for railroad crossings and road crossings. Um, as Nicole said, created these, uh, you know, the culverts that are undersized and make it impossible and very difficult for fish to move through. They they exist by the hundreds, and, and there there are opportunities. We think though to, to remove some more of those, and uh, again, in one fell swoop, save money by not having to spend uh, a lot a lot of uh, public dollars to put in these fish ladders, but uh, by by dam removal, we're a little bit behind the curve on Long Island. Um, and the, the issue there is trying to convince, uh, we've, been, we've been thinking about this, trying to convince, you know, the, the property owners that live along it. I'll give a perfect example. I, I, I'm still a consultant town of Arcade, and I used to run the environmental program. So I was very involved uh, in the whole Carnage River restoration effort and the plan that we put in place for the town of Brookhaven. And <clears throat> that's one of the topics we talked about was, was actually an elimination of Upper and Lower Lake, if you know, they know along the Carmen's. Oh my gosh, that was pretty controversial to talk about that by removing the dams there. Imagine having the Carmen's River being a total free flowing river. Mm -hmm. Because the people that live along it, they, they know what they've got. They've got a pretty aesthetic, bucolic view uh, of these impoundments, not ponds, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and don't want to see that loss. I think one of the things we need to do actually, and maybe we can engage people like David Berg, who's got these technical expertise, is we need to do visual simulations using computers to, to try to show people what the, the, the place would look like once you remove the dams. They have done this, the American Rivers have done this in a lot of other places. And, and all these property owners still have, you know, property that's along water, it's just it happens to be a, a free-flowing stream or river compared to a, just this kind of a stagnant impoundment. So, John, yeah. State Parks has actually already made determin the determination regarding Westbrook, but they did it very, very quietly. And was it the determination? They're just leaving it. 
Let's go tell Frank Rover. Well, that's new. Okay, is that out yet? I mean, is that public knowledge? Uh, I'm not, not sure about that. It is now. <laughs> it is now. <laughs> yeah, we, well, we're quite, I didn't want to, we kind of thought that was maybe we've been, you know, pushing on this issue. It's hard to argue to read. To put back a dam. I mean, you've got the, you've got how many dozens of impoundments where people go fishing for pickerel and sunny sunfish and other things. It's not as if by, you know, leaving that that dam unrepaired that you're precluding some type of unique recreational event. You can do it everywhere on the island, other places. So let's have a free flowing system there, and that's wonderful news time. Thanks so much for, for that. And I want to leave some time for Q&A as well. So maybe um, we can kind of- I want to talk about the state wetland amendments. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a very critical conservation. Okay, so um, so uh, John requested a topic and I'll throw it out there. I, I, I wanted to talk about this as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, so this is super important is that, um, you know, since the, I think it was the 70s when the Freshwater Wetlands Act was first enacted, uh, the jurisdiction over wetlands for the state extended to uh, wetlands that were 12.4 acres or greater or subjectively deemed of unusual local importance. And really what that meant was it appears on a map. Um, and the maps are very expensive to steward and update. And unfortunately, the DEC sort of had their um, hands tied sometimes uh, and, and perhaps um, strategically had their hands tied in certain instances. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to report, however, um, recently that the Freshwater Wetlands Act was amended as part of the budget process. Uh, and the, I, I believe the 12.4 acre no, stuck. No, oh, it, you know, it's, it's down to seven. Okay, well, 7.3 acres, which is good. But um, I think the more critical part of this is that um, the unusual importance determination is now decoupled from the, this mapping process. Uh, and, and this is critical because, it, it, and there's also a, a bunch of provisions that uh, further specify, you know, what what might constitute unusual importance. So, you know, with that segue, I, I want to talk about. Uh, I want to hand the mic to to John Turner, who's been working uh, very closely with with the uh, the advocates here on this. And, and if you can kind of just sure. tell people, yeah. yeah so, so there's some wonderful news when it comes to wetland protection uh, in New York State on Long Island that you you may not have heard about. I want to bring to your attention as Two seconds, step back to, to, to kind of reiterate, because we're throwing out a lot of jargon to you today, is that wetland protection at the state level occurs through the, the Tidal Wetlands Act and the Freshwater Wetlands Act, two acts that were passed uh, in the early to mid-1970s. The Freshwater Wetlands Act, since it was passed, had really never been significantly amended, even though many decades of practical experience has gone by. And, through that time, we realized a lot of the shortcomings in the act and a lot of things that, some things that it did very well, but a lot of a lot of shortcomings. So this year, the stars aligned correctly and through the work of a lot of us in a wetland coalition, most notably, I will say, Sierra Club at the Albany level with Roger Downs and Erin McGrath at Audubon, New York Audubon, and then a bunch of other us were involved in an effort to do a complete rewrite of the Freshwater Wetlands Act. And that has happened, it is now law, and it significantly advances freshwater wetlands protection in the state in a, just a few of the following ways. One is the, again, as, as Frank mentioned, there's this totally arbitrary political decision that was made originally to have a 12.4 acre threshold cutoff. So think about it, a wetland upstate, a pond of 10 acres in size could have been filled, could be, because it, it didn't meet the, the threshold for being regulated. <clears throat> it was, uh, again, uh, and I remember hearing about it, an arcane uh, compromise between the Assembly and the Senate when they were negotiating the bill. The, the, the Senate wanted 25 acre cutoff and the Assembly wanted five. They, they went to 12.4 acres or five hectares was the political compromise at the time. Anyway, this legislation will now bring it down to 7.4 acres thereby capturing another million acres of wetlands in the state that will be protected. That doesn't kick in, unfortunately, until 2028, again, it's a political compromise, but DEC will be responsible for documenting those uh, wetlands that are uh, between 7.4 acres and 12.4 acres. And as Frank mentioned, the most significant co component of wetland protection as it relates to Long Island is this uh, provision of called wetlands of unusual local significance. 
So if there's a wetland lower or smaller than 7.4 acres, say, oh my gosh, is it, could we run the risk of it being you know, destroyed, filled, drained, whatever, on the island? <clears throat> there are now 11, and I've got, I brought it with me here, um, 11 uh, criteria upon which you can uh, um, look at a wetland and determine if it meets any one of these 11, it can be designated as a wetland of unusual, again, local significance. So if it's a wetland that's in a watershed that's experienced significant flooding in the past, it might. The, if that wetland contains a plant species occurring in fewer than 35 sites statewide or having fewer than 5,000 individual um, uh, statewide uh, you know, population of some rare plants. So again, recognizing that wetlands often provide habitat for a whole host of rare plant species. If it contains habitat for an endangered or threatened species. If it's a wetland in a, a U.S. Census designated urban area, well, guess what? All Long Island's an urban area. So we got. So anyway, shall I say through the back door, we basically will move to protect every wetland on Long Island through the passage of that. So really, really critical. The last thing I'll say is that that we talked about the mapping, the old freshwater wetlands mapping, and. Less so a title is that you, they really were dependent on DEC staff going on mapping and delineating all the freshwater wetlands. And if you weren't if that delineated on that, you weren't subject um, to, uh, to regulation and protection. That's been flipped on its head. The presumption is that it's a wetland and the property owner have to have to demonstrate that it's not a wetland if they want to be able to move forward with the project. There's a bunch of other things that, but again, just to make the point that that this past legislative session just added 2022 budget. There's some very significant positive uh, uh, progress with regard to wetland protection in the state. And, and that's freshwater wetlands. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so that was just, yeah. that's strictly freshwater wetlands. Because yes. the title went, well, uh, the yeah. set with, you know, protected based on maps from 1973 and thought at the time, done, fixed, now we don't have to think about them anymore. Not Didn't appreciate that these are dynamic systems. Right that need that dynamism to function, persist in the future, and migrate landward. So just, the, it's a huge, huge win for freshwater wetlands. It can certainly play a role too, also uh, in, in, in all the Jessica. Yeah, so we had we had a whole thing of um, solutions too, that, uh, of our little uh, pre-scripted questions that I asked maybe one of um, um, <laughs> during this topic. But I think we, we, we heard a lot of solutions here. And, and I really, I think it's probably uh, appropriate to turn it over to, to the audience to get some question Q and A. Um, I saw David's hand pop up. So why don't you, why don't you hop in and uh, you know, ask a question, please. Uh, thank you. Um, so with respect to the 1974 Tyler Wetland, a long time ago, when I was in Canada, we did uh, we remapped all of New York State's tidal wetlands using infrared satellite imagery with ground truth. Is that being used? That map? That um, Cameron et al. 2015 <coughs> report and maps are hugely valuable. They have. In one one thing they did was by letting us know how much has in fact changed since wetlands were were mapped and regulated in 1973 and the, and the Tidal Wetlands Act in 1974 based on those. So we now know what changes we're experiencing. We know that our current wetland um, wetlands don't match the regulatory maps from the 1973. Um, but the state is not using those maps that Cameron uh, and land use created for regulatory purposes because there would have been many more steps they would have had to go through to do that. I think what we need to appreciate is that, is the dynamism of these systems. They will not exist. They do not exist now where they existed in 1973. They will not exist in the future exactly where they exist now. And that's why we need to think about the natural processes, the dynamic processes that they need to move into the future. But the, so extent is one big takeaway from the Cameron work. The other is the types of changes we're seeing. So we are losing mar tidal marsh from its edges. So it's eroding back from natural creeks, mosquito ditches, dredged channels. We are, um, the marshes are not keeping pace with sea level rise, so the habitats are not keeping pace with sea level rise. We've got a lot more intertidal or low marsh that floods twice a day now, and much less 
high marsh. And so that was something else that the Cameron work identified for us was the places where we are losing high marsh habitat at faster rates um, than others. And then the expansion of invasive species like Phragmites because the Cameron work identified where what the Phragmites extent was and the freshwater extent was in 73 versus uh, 2005, 2008, those infrared images. And the DEC is not going to change their mapping from 1974, which was basically a magic marker on a piece of paper. Uh, but here's the flip side. The flip side is when we uh, do grant submissions, uh, we use a, a, a lot of the more recent images. Um, and that's uh, really how we make the case. Uh, so, uh, you know, this little packet I gave uh, out uh, that has wetland uh, management in Suffolk County uh, delineates those cases. Uh, it has the imaging uh, as a part of uh, what um, has been included. So you can go there and, and get all excited about the fact that your work is actually uh, making a difference because not only is it, you know, important to understand, you know, where we are relatively, but we also know that uh, we have to, you know, uh, just do a lot of reclamation. And um, and so and to that spirit, and I'm just going to quickly add it because I think the solutions end of the thing <coughs> that we, we kind of glossed over it, uh, but know that uh, subsequent to Sandy, not only did we get uh, considerable funding, millions of dollars uh, for wetland rec regu uh, 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 reclamation, but um, we also made the case that the, and uh, Robert brought this up in the beginning, that the, uh, the wetlands are a second line of defense. Um, and based upon that, we got over $400 million in funding for extending sewers on the South Shore, which directly impact, impacts the Great South Bay. Um, and that was an argument that had you, you could have extracted, as we did, from the peer review articles, but it wasn't one that has been used at, up until this point to actually realize that caliber of funding. Think about that. You know, we hadn't done any kind of uh, you know, sewer extension work in this county since the great scandal of the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and then on top of that, of course, we're, we, we recognize that sewering is prohibitively expensive in most cases. Um, so we are going with these uh, on-site systems that are advanced and they treat for nitrogen and they bring them down to 10 milligrams and we've got a very robust program again, tens of millions of dollars coming from the state um, and we and do not use historical, you know, restrictive imaging in, you know, in, in accordance with the legislation, which is why it's important to understand that not only do you have to address this legislatively, uh, but you do need to have really, you know, proactive efforts um, to, uh, I think, creatively <coughs> identify how this stuff is going to be paid for. Um, and I could get into greater depth because it's what I do on a daily basis, but there's one other uh, portion of this that I'd ask you to keep in mind as we move forward. You also have to be very innovative. Um, you're looking right here at somebody who was the originator of property assessed clean energy in terms of residential energy efficiency, <coughs> meaning that this kind of work paid for itself. Moving forward, what's really interesting, I think, in the realm that we're talking about today are blue carbon credits, not green carbon credits, but the amount of sequestration that happens if, for example, you revive your eelgrass, uh, certainly revive the wetlands, thereby, conceivably, having those credits pay for that work. And I think that's something to bear in mind and pay attention to as we move forward. Okay, I saw Mike Bettini's hand go up. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, so a uh, question to Nicole, when you're uh, doing your island-wide uh, monitoring of salt marshes, are you noticing any differences in, in the abundance of uh, mud fiddlers and, uh, and the uh, rib mussels that are so important to that system? Thanks, Mike. I'm glad you bring up the fiddlers and the mussels. I have not been monitoring those, but other folks who have sort of lived close to the water and been observing these systems out on the east end in Peconic, um, they think that they've seen a change in sort of fiddler abundances. Uh, the other crab that we have is a nocturnal crab called Sasarma, and they also build burrows in our marshes. I think that's something that we need to learn a lot more about especially as we plan restoration efforts and we try to remediate or remove some linear mosquito ditches and sort of establish more of a tide shed, like a watershed, but within the tidal salt marsh system, because these crabs that burrow into the peat love to have peat without dense roots and rhizomes that they'd have to push out of the way to make their and maintain their burrows. Um, and so crab 
response to restoration is something that we really need to learn more about and be mindful of when we plan restoration projects. One thing that we're seeing out in Akabonic Harbor in East Hampton <coughs> and within Peconic Bay is that there are crabs that appear to be abandoning their burrows as they disturb the marsh peat and then there's a lot of sediment, loose sediment around it. They will leave an area if they can't maintain their burrows because it keep, they keep getting filled in. And that's an opportunity for the salt marsh grasses to recolonize those areas because the crabs aren't um, digging up. So crabs are interesting because they aerate the sediment. So plants produce oxygen when they photosynthesize, but they need oxygen around their roots in order to take in the nutrients that they need to grow. So the crabs actually help aerate the soil so that the, the marsh grasses can grow well, but an overabundance of crabs can disturb that soil <laughs> to the point where the marsh plants cannot take root and hold it together. Um, and and mus rib mussels are, the they are very important in terms of trapping sediment um, and, and building peat, but too many of them can also disturb the peat and add too, much, too many nutrients that changes the way the plants grow below ground too. So the, we're always learning. We need to be open to always questioning and learning because that's the only way we're going to be able to move forward. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. For yeah. yeah. Thanks. I, I, we could talk about wetlands all day. Yeah. Unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I'd like to say thank you to all of our speakers. Yes, sure. yeah. I just want to throw one thing. I didn't. I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but I'm happy afterwards. Is uh, some work that the town of Brookhaven has done in concert with the county and the state to protect the domestic marshlands. Uh, it's a very, very positive, very <clears throat> significant effort. Um, I don't want to take more time, but, but I, afterwards, if you're interested more about it, I'm happy to chat. It has to do with restoration. It has to do with the eliminating road segments. We've been buying a lot of land, a lot of small parcels with the county. And, and it's one, the one area that probably on all the down, sea level rise may allow for, for well, you know, the, the salt water wetlands to migrate north. Anyway. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, John.